thank God for His grace this morning. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning about what is the gospel. What is the gospel? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll read uh, verses 1 to 4 just in a couple of minutes. While I was in the capital of Burundi, uh, the capital is Bujumbura, one of the churches that we ministered at on a Sunday morning, the pastor of the church had a staff pastor just before the service. Well, it was actually part of the service, but it was the uh, beginning part. He had him address this topic, what is the gospel? And I asked the pastor afterwards, I says, do you do that every Sunday and why do you do that? And he said they did it every Sunday morning. They would take almost a half hour. Now understand, uh, you know, us in the United States, we're used to a church service of an hour, an hour and a half. And uh, if we're really stretched, two hours. But in other parts of the world, their worship services could go on for three, four hours. And I heard a few grunts, no amens. (laughs) But... So the introduction for a half hour, basically, was explaining what the gospel was. So they do this every Sunday. So I asked, why do you do this? And I was told by the pastor that they are dealing with so many different teachings, so much false doctrine, so many extremes, and the gospel even being mixed with culture and tradition. And they were saying how how critical it was that in the church, that they took the time to explain the simple gospel. That got me thinking. Got me thinking about the church in the United States. Got me thinking about our church. It got me thinking about a lot of Christians. Are we really getting the message? Are we really getting the gospel? Do we really know what the gospel is? Bonner Research tells us that fewer than 50% of all adults can name the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I just gave you a hint. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. 60% of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. You could all breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going to put any of you on the spot this morning. 82% of Americans believe that God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. It's a good saying. It's true in some cases, but it's not in the Bible. 12% believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Graduating high school seniors, listen, graduating high school seniors, 50% of them believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wives. God have mercy. You heard this statistic or you heard this research. This is a very, very uh, sobering, sad, uh, and challenging uh, statistic or research that was done. 2015, Providence, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, was was found to be the least biblically minded city in the United States. In the research that they did, obviously they didn't call or poll any of you here from Victory Assembly of God. That would have changed the statistics. But it's a sad reality. Uh, one, one, one small little uh, piece of good, in, good news regarding that is that Providence has gained two spots in the, in the latest polling. We went from the least biblically minded to the third least biblically minded behind Albany slash Schenectady, New York, and Boston, Massachusetts. Digital marketing experts estimate that most Americans are exposed to around 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements each day. Buy this, wear that, 
go there, drive that, brush with this, goggle with that, et cetera, et cetera. Four to 10,000 messages, advertisements coming at us every day. What I found interesting, listen to this, this is really interesting. Well, it's interesting to me anyway, so I'm going to say it. Only a hundred actually make it past our attention wall each day. Because to keep our sanity, we've developed a screening process to ignore most advertising messages. So think of that. Only a hundred actually make it through the thousands of messages that come at us every day. I think that's pretty amazing. So, so needless to say... We have an incredible amount of information, advertisement, stimuli coming to us on a daily basis. And I believe it carries over spiritually to our spiritual uh, well-being or our spiritual, the spiritual part of us. We have, met, we have beliefs that are all over the board. We have extremes in doctrine. We have heresies, false doctrines. We have so many things that even Christians, because of social media and even TV, they begin to question whether certain things are right and wrong. The other night, just flipping the channels, came across, I forgot exactly, I think his name is something Tyler. He's the medium to the stars. And uh, I call my wife over to, to, to see it. And, and, and here's this man who some of the most uh, A-listers, some of the biggest stars in, in Hollywood, have him come to their house to, to, to divine their future or to tell them something about their life, to, to bring up people from the dead, basically, and give them messages and I'm telling you, these are stars that you would be amazed at, that they're, they're journalists, they're movie stars, they're professional athletes that actually have this man come in and, 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 he, and he takes a cloth, he takes something of significant connection to that person that they want to know or get a message from and he holds it and he looks like he's getting a message from beyond. And I don't know if it's true or not, but these movie stars are, are, are amazed at, at what he tells them. And, and either, either he, he's very intuitive or he taps into demonic powers. It surely isn't the Holy Spirit. It isn't prophetic insight that God gives because Jesus Christ would be glorified and it would be for a redemptive purpose. And there's none of that, none of that, none of that. But Christians could be deceived and they can say, wow. Back years ago, Christians, uh, I heard of Christians going to psychics, Christians calling up the me, you know, the, the, the Chloe, what was her name on TV, you know, all those, uh, uh, she could divine the future, but she didn't see the, the, the uh, FBI coming after her <laughs> and shutting her down because of her shenanigans, but, but many Christians and, and many, many God-fearing people get confused and get deceived and I want to look at this passage of Scripture and just take a few moments. Today, we are going to partake of communion in, in obedience to the command of Jesus. Jesus said to do this in remembrance of me. See, Jesus knew something about human nature, something about you and I, how quickly we forget what's important in life. We forget what's important in life. I was at a funeral this past Friday, and, you know, at a funeral, we all get very, very uh, sentimental, and we get very uh, uh, attuned to what's really important. But then when we go away from a funeral, we, we, we just seem to forget. We forget brevity of life. We forget how important family is. We forget how important you know, relationships are, and we just go back. That's why Jesus said, keep coming to the table. You need to keep being reminded. You need to, to keep being confronted with what's really eternally important. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes this. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel 
which I also preach to you, also which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, first of all, what he's saying there of, of utmost importance. First of all, that which I received from Christ, that received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul states some helpful and interesting things about the gospel. And I just want to walk through this with you. I just want to share these with you. How many of you are ready to receive the word of God this morning? I think that's interesting because the first point that I want to share is that the gospel is to be received. It's to be received. He says in verse 1, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received it. You received it. You see, they didn't invent this message. They didn't make it up. But they received it from the apostle Paul. You and I this morning, week after week, day after day, as you read the word of God, understand you are receiving God's holy word. You are receiving truth. You are receiving a seed which is planted in your heart. And the Bible says it's an incorruptible seed. It is able to save your soul. How critical, how important it is. See, Paul didn't invent the message. The Corinthians didn't invent the message. Matter of fact, Paul himself says in verse 3, I delivered what to you, first of all, that I myself received. Paul, in Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus, and he was a Christ hater. He was a Christ rejecter. Matter of fact, he was persecuting those who believed in Jesus. And the Bible says, while he was on the road to Damascus to apprehend and to kill Christians, the Bible says that he saw Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And he himself had an encounter with Christ that radically changed his life. How many of you know that you can have an encounter with Christ that will radically change your life? That Jesus Christ is still alive and he's still changing people's lives. Praise God for that. And so they received it. They believed in it. You know, you and I will live in this world. We will live in life and face trials. There will be struggles. There will be questions and discouragement. You know, all of us go through that. But Paul was reminding them, listen, you received it at one point. You had a revelation. You saw the light. Don't forget what you experienced. You see, many times we have an encounter with God an experience with God, and the light is shining, the glory of God is revealed to us, but then we go through a season of trial, a season of discouragement, where everything becomes very dark. Paul wanted to remind them, listen, you receive this. Maybe now you've gone through some trials, but don't forget what you saw in the light. You cannot allow the dark seasons of life to f cause you to forget what you experienced in the light. Someone once said you don't change trains when you're going through a tunnel when it's dark. In other words, you know the direction you're going. You might go through a tunnel. It might be dark. You can't see outside what's going on. You might not know exactly how, how, what it looks like out there, but you know the direction you're going on. You know the, the, the choice you made. You keep on going till you come out and the light shines again. It's the same thing with a trial. The gospel is to be received. Number two, the gospel gives stability. Look at verse 1. He says, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. The function of the gospel, the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to give people stability. Jesus said, on this rock, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. When we went to Israel, we visited the place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is in the farthest northern point of the land of Israel. And in Caesarea Philippi, it's where Jesus made this declaration where he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will build my church upon this rock. And what was interesting is in that area of Caesarea Philippi, it is, it is a great mountainous, rocky region. And in that area, we visited a place where there were ro- mountains and rocks that were so giant and so incredible. And they were also a place where there were shrines built to false gods. And so what Jesus was saying in that place upon this rock He was saying, even in the midst of the most idolatrous, most wicked, godless area, I will build my church. Upon this rock, he was saying, over the the, the fortress of the enemy, over the, the, the strongholds of the enemy, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, the gospel builds stability in our life. You see, in a slippery world, How many of you know culture is changing so rapidly? What is right and wrong in the eyes of most people has changed. Values are under siege. Social media is making people think they know what they're saying is right or wrong. And there's so much confusion. But Paul is saying that you stand in the gospel. The scriptures tell us over and over, over, stand firm, stand fast, having done all to stand. I like what the the hymn writer said, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, the gospel gives us stability in a slippery world, in a tempting world. The gospel gives us power to resist evil. There are the lust of the eyes, the Bible tells us, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have power to resist evil. The gospel gives us stability in a slippery world, in a tempting world, and in a hurting world. You and I are enabled to endure heartbreak, physical suffering, and not to give up because of the power of the gospel. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read a few verses of scripture. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us of people who had experienced the gospel, but then they went through some trials. Verse 32, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. Listen to this. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Wow, the gospel gives stability. Look what they went through. And they had joy even though they had such suffering and such loss. How many of you would say, God, I need that joy in my life? Some of us get so upset when, when things don't go our way. There's a little too much traffic in the morning. I mean, we, we get up, upset if the Dunkin' Donuts lady doesn't make our coffee the right way. I mean, we think that's a trial. Look what they went through. They suffered the plundering of their goods. In other words, they lost their possessions because they identified with Christ, but they still had joy. Job chapter 4, verse 4. Your words have kept men on their feet. Hallelujah. Come on, I'm talking about stability this morning. The gospel brings stability. The word of God will keep you on your feet. The gospel also brings salvation. Verse 2, he says, by which also you are saved. The gospel brings salvation. Now, I don't want to get too technical this morning. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you awake? I hope most of you got the right 
response in the affirmative. But in the original language, stay with me for a couple of more moments. Those are not literal couple minutes. That's preacher couple minutes. So that it's a whole different frame of reference. But in verse 2, in the original language in which also you are saved, that, that is in the present tense. The Greek structure, the Greek grammar is not in the past tense. You were saved, but in the present tense. And, and, and it, it could better read in which you are being saved. Now I want you to understand something. Salvation goes from glory to glory, the Bible says. Our salvation is never completed in this world. Now stay with me. The meaning of salvation is something that can never be exhausted. There are three facets or three uh, uh, degrees or three seasons, if you will, of our salvation. The Bible says we've been saved. The Bible says we're being saved. And the Bible says we will be saved. Okay, so you really have to be awake. Stay with me this morning. I, I want to give you a little theology. I told you we need to be, be learning what the gospel is, and, and we need to be stretched. I know you have a lot of messages coming at you, so I only have you for a brief amount of time on a Sunday morning. But, but the Bible talks about being saved. That's justification. If I can give you some theological terms quickly. Justification means just as if I never sinned. When you and I give our lives to Jesus Christ, it does not matter what our past was. It doesn't matter what sins we've committed. It doesn't matter how many commandments we, we broke. When we come to Jesus and we're born again, the Bible says we are justified. We are saved. Justification is not only God taking away our sin, but it is giving us his righteousness. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus took our sin on the cross and in turn gave us his righteousness. I'm telling you, that is quite a deal. You ought to say praise God this morning because God takes away all our sins. That's still good news. I don't care how long you've been saved. That's still something to say praise the Lord over. Takes all our sin and in turn gives us his righteousness. So we're justified. Justified. But we're also being saved. What does that mean? That is sanctification. Another theological term. That means that in this life, although we're saved, we're being saved, meaning that we are being sanctified. We're becoming less like the old way. And we're becoming more like Jesus. We're letting go of our past. We're letting go of the ways of the flesh. We're letting go of sin. Could someone say amen this morning? And we're becoming more like Jesus. Let me tell you, if you are born again, you have to understand something. You need to work on being sanctified. You need to learn that your life needs to reflect the gospel and the Christ that you proclaim. You can't just say, I'm born again. Oh, I'm a Christian. No, your life ought to show it. Come on, somebody say amen. Not because of what you did, but because of what God did in you, and it has to come out of you. So you are saved in the past, that's justification, and then you're being saved in the present, which is sanctification. And that's a process that continues all through your life. None of us are perfect. Turn to the person next to you, say, you're not perfect. My, my father, gr growing up, uh, when my mother and father used to argue, now these are old-time Italians, and, you know, I'm sure, how many of you, you know, Things come to your mind your parents used to say, your grandparents. They just stick with you. And uh, growing up, my, my father, when he would, was mad at my, 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 my mother, God rest their souls, they going on before us. But they, my, my father used to say to my, my, my mother when, when she thought she was always right, or my father said, oh, yeah, I forgot, you're perfect. I use that with my wife now. You know, it's funny how these things come back to you. I tell my wife, oh, that's right, you're perfect. Uh, but none of us are perfect. That's why we're being sanctified. We're being made more like Jesus. And that is a process. That's called discipleship. That's called learning to follow Jesus on a daily basis. Becoming more like Christ. Becoming Christ-like. You should be more Christ-like today than you were three years ago. 
You should be more like Jesus today than you were a few, a year ago, two years ago. It's a process. So, so we're saved justification. We're being saved that sanctification. And the ultimate is glorification. That is the con- consummation of our salvation. That's when we get to heaven. We'll be glorified. You're going to get a new body. Hallelujah. Come on, you ought to shout over that. Some of you men, you've been working on your six-pack, and all you got is a keg. But when you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, you're going to have a perfect body. Hallelujah. Some of you women, you started off with a, with a, with a Coke bottle figure. You got a liter bottle, but praise the Lord. When you get to heaven, you're going to have a new body. Hallelujah. Glorified body. Perfect. All imperfections gone. We're going to have a body just like the Lord. Hallelujah. And that we, you know why we have to have a new body? Because mortality cannot inherit immortality. This mortal flesh could not live in the glory of heaven. Because heaven is perfect. So God is going to give us a new body. We're going to be glorified just like Jesus. We're going to have a spiritual body, a spiritual being that will be able to live forever and ever and ever in a place called heaven. Hallelujah. That is the goal. That is the consummation, consummation of our salvation. That is glorification. Let me just break it down a little bit more. Justification is being delivered from sin's penalty. The Bible tells us the soul that sins will die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You see, justification is being delivered from sin's penalty. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Jesus, he did it all on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins. He took our place. That's justification. Sanctification is being delivered from sin's power. Sin is powerful. You give the devil a toehold, he'll take a foothold, and he'll make a stronghold. You dabble in sin, can you be forgiven? Yes, you can. Can you get out of some sins? Yes, you can. But you know what? The more deeper you go into sin, the devil takes a cord around you. And just like Samson, you can get out and shake yourself and be delivered. But sooner or later, you get too involved in any sin, any lust, any, anything. It doesn't have to be the outward things we all know about. It could be other things that, that get us into bondage. When I was in Bible college, I had a, a godly, one of the godly, godly, one of our godly teachers you know, and they would just say some things, and sometimes when you're in Bible school and you're young, you think you know it all, and, you know, they'll say a quote, and, and, and it's sort of like a life message. It's something they'll put in the yearbook, and, and, and you might not think too much about it, but the older you get and the more you learn, the more powerful they are. She said this. She said, let nothing master you but the master. Let nothing master you but the master. How many of you know there's so many things that want to master us? So many things that want to take control of our minds, our hearts. I tell you, it, it could be so many things, our emotions, fears, things of our past. Try to, try to just pull us and, and entangle us. And, and they keep us from being who God created us to be. What I love so much about the worshiping and, and being in the presence of God is when I'm in his presence, all those things get stripped away in a, in a revelation and an understanding. And I realize, wow, God, what you've done in my life is so awesome. But then when you get away from the presence of God, all those thoughts and all those cares just begin to weigh you down again. That's why we need to continue to be sanctified. So justification, deliverance from sin's penalty. Sanctification, deliverance from sin's power. Glorification, deliverance from sin's presence. Thank God in heaven. No more sin. No more suffering. No more sickness. No more death. I don't know about you, but don't you just get sick, some, get sick of yourself, sick of sin, sick of Satan. Come on. One day in heaven, totally delivered from it all. Hallelujah. How many of you want to go to heaven? How many of you want to die? That's the way it is. Praise the Lord. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. I'm almost done. 
John, John Stott, the theologian, he argues that when Paul reasoned with Governor Felix in, in Roman and, and the book of Acts, the Bible says that, that Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And I thought this was interesting. I never saw it like this. John Stott argues that when, when, when Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, judgment to come, he was really pointing out the three stages of salvation. Salvation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. You see, this message of salvation takes care of everything in our life. It takes care of our history, and it takes care of our destiny. Hallelujah. Salvation takes care of our past, our present, and our future. And I conclude with this. The gospel is to be held tenaciously. Look at verse 2. He says, if you hold fast... If you hold fast that gospel. Life makes many attempts to take away our faith. Things happen to us. Happen to other people that baffle our understanding. Life has problems to which there seems to be no solutions. Questions that seem to have no answers. Reminded of the psalmist in Psalm 73, he starts off and he says, truly God is good. And we can give that testimony and sometimes we can praise God and say the Lord is good. But then we go through trials. And that happened to the psalmist in Psalm 73. He starts off saying, truly God is good. But then he says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped when I considered the suffering of the godly, when I considered the prosperity of the wicked, when I looked at life from a, from a horizontal perspective, when I looked at life in the natural, he said it was too painful for me, that my thoughts troubled me because it was so hard to, to grasp and understand how could this be, and, and he says, I came to the point of saying, you know, surely I've cleansed my heart in vain, what he was saying was, well, well maybe, maybe it wasn't worth following God. Maybe it wasn't worth giving my life to Jesus if this is how it's going to be. But I'm glad he didn't stay there. If you're there this morning, don't stay there. Go into the sanctuary. I'm not just talking about a building, but I'm talking about going into the presence of God. The Bible says, Asaph, the writer of that psalm, he says, it was too painful. It hurt me. Until I went into the sanctuary. Then I understood. You see what happened with, with, with Asaph. The writer of that psalm. He, he went beyond reason. He went to revelation. He went beyond the natural. What everybody else heard and saw and felt. And he went into the place of the presence of God. And got a revelation. You've got to get a revelation. You've got to get insight. You've got to get understanding from God's word, from the Holy Spirit. Because if you look at this world truth, just through the natural lens, if you just look at this world through the way things are, you'll get confused and confounded. You'll give up on your faith. But if you go into the presence of God, faith is always the victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. He concludes by saying, I deliver to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What he was doing was putting a theological twist or giving understanding. Many people died under the hands of the Romans in the first century, but only one man died for the sins of the world. He died. He died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day, again, according to the scripture. You see, our gospel is substantive. It means it has substance. It's supported by facts. The gospel which collapsed, or the faith that collapses is the faith that has not thought things out and thought things through. For many people, faith is superficial. You see, but we need to think and process and learn the gospel. Paul, while he was in prison, he was suffering. He says, I know whom I have believed in. 
I know whom I have believed in. Even though I'm suffering, even though I'm treated as an evildoer, I know whom I have believed in and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You might not understand it all. You might not know it all, but I just encourage you, keep growing in your faith. Keep growing in your knowledge of the Word of God. Keep growing in revelation. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you things and show you things. You might not know it all, but I trust you know what that man knew in John chapter 9 after Jesus healed the blind man. When, they, when the theologians questioned him, he says, I don't know, might not know all the theology, but one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. We must understand that the gospel is for us, but it's for all people. It is non-negotiable. There is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask the, the musicians, the singers to come back. We're going to sing one chorus before we partake of communion. And this is a song that was written. I believe they used the Apostles' Creed. Some of you remember the Apostles' Creed growing up. But it's, it's an affirmation of truth. I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ the Son. Started earlier by saying there are thousands of messages coming at us every day. They're increasing with, and you know, our brain could only retain and receive so much. We're really on overload. You know, attendance is down in, in major baseball stadiums. Uh, seems like the younger generation just don't, don't go to ball games because it's too, too long and boring. I mean, it wasn't boring for us. I think we had a little longer attention span. But I think today, because of social media, because of all of the messages coming at us, we are so, our attention span is about 13 seconds. And we've lost the ability to focus. But I pray and I believe this morning that the Holy Spirit's going to help us. Would you stand? Would you stand? And I want to sing this song. I want you to declare it today. The best way to banish doubt and fear is to speak God's word. When, 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 when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, every temptation, he said, it is written. It is written. You don't, you don't resist the devil in your own power. You don't resist the devil in my name or your name. You resist the devil through the word of God. It is written. And so let's declare. We're going to sing it once and then I'm going to pray. And we're going to come and we're going to partake. Let's sing it. Discouraged, just to clear it. In this broken generation, Even if you have some questions this morning, still declare it. When all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. Only one salvation. We believe. Yes. Come on, let's sing it out. Let's declare it. Come on, my faith.
praise the Lord. Come on, give him praise. Give him thanks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.